Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't know what it is about this barrier here. I don't... Just something. Anyway, so today... We're going to look at the book of Matthew, and specifically, we're going to be looking at the last story that Jesus tells in the ser- on the Sermon on the Mount, okay? So we are going to read from chapter 7 in Matthew, verses 24 to 27, and it's, I'm reading from the Common English Bible, which is above my head, so if you'd like to follow, or you can just close your eyes and let the word wash over you. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise builder who built his house on bedrock. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against that house. It didn't fall because it was firmly set on bedrock. But everybody who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice will be like a fool who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against that house. It fell and was completely destroyed. This is the word of God for the people of God. And God's people say, thanks be to God. Amen. So in the last few weeks, we've been talking about uh, the image of God and Uh, being created in that image, and grace, and what that means. And we've talked about being the church, and what that means, and how lives are transformed in being the body of Christ within and outside our church community. And so today, we're going to start a series, um, and it's going to be called The Fruit of Living Faith. And the idea came from the book that I'm holding in my hand, and um, I was given, it was given to me um, by John Powers and his wife Sharon for my licensing, and when I was getting settled into my apartment one night, I picked it up and I began to read it, and I couldn't put it down. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's not much, but as we all know, um, awesome things come in small packages. Um, <laughs> And, and as you can also see, I have loved this book to the point of pink sticky tabs all over it. And if you know me well enough, um, I, I like to write in the margins of my books, and I also like to use sticky tabs. So if you ever see a book in my office that has this kind of decoration, you know that it's a good book for me anyway. Um, so during this time, during the time that I was reinvestigating my call. I mean, and I say reinvestigating because there were two times in my life that I can specifically remember that I had a calling to ministry. And the first time when when I was about 10 years old, and um, I, I didn't understand it. I didn't get all of the doctrine and things like that. I just remember this presence of sorts and, um, and, and an undesirable or a desirable pull, and, um, and it kind of stopped there. And then the second time was in my early 40s after attending a United Methodist Church in Florida. I'd heard a lot and I'd read a lot about this radical John Wesley and his brother Charles. And his life, his understanding of God, it resonated with me to the point that um, I wanted to know more. So I read more and I listened to people called lifelong Methodists who were my friends and people that I respected and I loved. And, and through his life and the lives of countless others, I was able to readjust that understanding of who God was through the meaning of grace. Because as a child brought up in a different denomination in the early 70s, the concept of grace was far from my understanding. John Wesley in my eyes, had a practical understanding and of living the gospel of Jesus Christ. This movement called Methodism, it wasn't meant to be a separatist movement. It was more of a restorative movement in the Anglican Church. And the name Methodist was given to this group of students who were studying at Oxford who met on a regular basis, kind of like your covenant seed groups do, you know? Um, and, they, and their description was, as a life of discipleship lived out in relationship to the scriptural pr- uh, principles and practices that all Christians have followed since the time of Jesus. That's how they described it. And it may have been the way they studied or how they met, how they prayed, that drew sometimes negative attention. 
And in the midst of all of that tension, they, the movement began to grow. And John Wesley, um, in response to that growth and to that criticism sometimes, wrote a treatise called The Character of a Methodist. And he gives this definition of five distinctive characteristics that convey who the group called Methodist are and what they believe. It's a quintessential, all-encompassing definition of, of not only what it meant to be a Methodist, but more importantly, what it meant to be a Christian. And as a side note, um, I emailed the link to Gloria, and on our website, and possibly on our Facebook page, we're going to have this link of the, the treaties, the character of a Methodist. And if you're interested, um, you can read it in its entirety. It's about four pages, um, but it's a very interesting read, so it is there. Um, but... Um, what John Wesley says in the treaties in response to the question that is, was often asked of him was, what is a Methodist? So I took it from the treaties, and um, it's rather interesting because you might find some, some very familiar words in here. And so what he's always asked is, what then is the mark? Who is a Methodist according to your account? And he answers, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Spirit given unto him, one who loves the Lord God with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his mind and with all his strength. God is the joy of his heart and the desire of his soul, which is constantly crying out, Whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee? My God and my all, thou art my strength in my heart and my portion forever. And so that's how John Wesley describes being a Methodist. And it might be um, kind of familiar to you um, because it is marks of a Christian. Those marks um, are very distinctive, and he, he shares them as building blocks. And so in the next five weeks, the, we're going to, to take them apart, and we're going to talk about them. And so those five are a Methodist loves God, a Methodist rejoices in God. A Methodist gives thanks. A Methodist prays constantly. And a Methodist loves others. And now I know what you're thinking. These characteristics are characteristics of a Christian. And yes, you're right, you're correct, because John Wesley does indeed speak to that very, very thought in the treaties. So how does that reading, or how does that treaties tie into the reading today? Wesley believed that Methodism, or Christianity, could not exist unless built on a solid foundation. In the character of a Methodist, he describes these characteristics as distinguishing marks, as a good foundation that would keep a person on the right track and sustain them throughout their life. Our story today talks about that solid foundation, because in the story of Matthew, I believe that the houses represent our lives. Because we're each building a life, yes? A life that will, not maybe, but will encounter many storms. Some of those events will look like spring showers, while other events look like uh, Hurricane Katrina, perhaps. And in that life, we'll have to respond to those storms, and depending on what we build our home on, according to Christ, will be how we respond to the storms. The foundation is whatever teaching, doctrine, philosophy we subscribe to, we can learn it from others, we develop it ourselves, and those distinctive marks or characteristics dictate how we will respond. So when we hear the word of God, do we live it out loud, like we talked about last week, or do we turn God away? When the storms in our lives come through, which in some cases, they take everything that is precious to us in life. It's very similar to the story of Job. And when we see that at times in the lives of our families and friends, we often wonder, how are they doing it? How are they surviving? How are they getting through this? And what Christ says is that the person who builds on bedrock can weather any storm. And those people live it out loud sometimes painfully, but there's a strength that comes from deep within, a foundation that reminds them whose they are. The storm can rough up the house a bit, and it'll take time to rebuild, but it remains standing. 
Now, on the other hand, the person who builds on sandy soil, Jesus says the house will be completely destroyed. Those are the people who hear God's word and turn away. Those are the people who drowned in their sorrow, and understandably so, but for some reason or another, they never seem to recover. And so it is in my you know, understanding and belief that these are the very people that people who have the strong foundation need to walk alongside of. So it is my hope during this series that not only will you learn a bit about the Methodist tradition, but more importantly, that you will learn what those distinguishing marks and characteristics and how they give you tools to survive the storms in your life. We will grow stronger in our relationship with God and one another and be able to develop skills that will assist us in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to those in need of hearing about God's love for them. So in the next five weeks, we'll take each one and we'll take a look at it. And there'll be questions on the website that you can um, study with if you'd like. Um, and if you want to meet me about them, you can do that and give me a call. Um, but just know that it's there. And know that the love of God is there for everybody with a, a strong foundation. Uh, maybe shaky sometimes, but that, that God can help us build an even stronger one. Will you pray with me? Loving God, the storms in our lives sometimes shake us at our core. But your love is like a foundation built on bedrock. Give us courage and strength to withstand the storm in our lives. And if we turn away, put those in our path that will walk alongside us to give us what we need to see your love until the storm passes. It is in your precious and almighty name that we pray. Amen.